For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. That is what Jesus said that day, the day that I finally met him for the first time. And I was one of those lost people. But all of that changed on the day I met Jesus. I started out looking for Jesus, but it turned out that he was looking for me too. And when he found me, he saw me for who I really was, not who everyone thought I was. Jesus called me by my name, and in doing so, he saved me. I'm sorry, I didn't introduce myself yet. My name is Zacchaeus, and my name means pure or holy one. And maybe you don't believe that I could possibly be pure or holy because you have heard that I am a tax collector and that I am very wealthy. You probably think that being a pure or holy tax collector is something like being an honest politician. It just cannot happen. Don't worry. Most people would agree with you. You've probably heard all about us tax collectors, how we make our money by partnering with the Roman government and then charging honest folks as much as we think we can get away with, that we grow rich from stealing from ordinary people, that we are sellouts to the Roman government, traitors to our own people. Don't you think that I've heard all those jokes that people tell about us? What's t what is 100 tax collectors at the bottom of the sea? A good start, they say. I hear those jokes, I feel the stares, and I've heard muttering under their breath when I come knocking on the door. I know how most people feel about my profession. And you probably distrust me because I am very good at my job. In fact, I am the chief tax collector. I do what I do well. I've moved up in my profession. And I am wealthy. I have a lot of money. And by the time that Jesus came through Jericho, all of us had heard what Jesus had to say to wealthy people. He told stories that suggested that it wasn't really the wealthy who were blessed by God, as we all thought. We thought that if you were wealthy, God had given you all that wealth. But no, Jesus always said it was the poor who were blessed by God. In fact, just a few days before I met Jesus, a rich young ruler had come and knelt before him. And Jesus told him that to enter the kingdom of God, he had to give away all he owned and sell it and give it to the poor. Jesus said that it was easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. So I knew what Jesus thought about wealthy people, people just like me. The trouble is that I don't think that I'm exactly like all other wealthy people, or at least not every other wealthy person. I've heard these words that Jesus said about giving to the poor at your gate, about expecting to serve them rather than having serve you. And you know, this is something that I'd always done ever since I was a little person. If people came to be with a need, I would meet it if I could. I would always try and chip in some money for a cause that was going around. I take the part of the Jewish religion that says that you have to give alms very seriously. I'm not bragging or anything, it's just a fact. I have money. I have riches. I have a nice home. My family is well cared for. But in addition to all of this, I give away a lot of money as well. I kind of like to think that since I've been so blessed by God, I need to bless others out of some of my material resources, and I've been doing this for years. But the truth is that it doesn't matter that I've done all this. It seems that no matter what I've done, no matter how much money I give away, no matter whose nephew I helped out starting out that business, or which needy family I gave a little bit of money to to tide them over till they could get back on their feet again, people always have the same opinion of me. I'm still disliked. Sure, people smile to my face, but they grit my teeth, their teeth when they see me coming to the door. They make a show of greeting me when I come to the synagogue, but they gossip about me behind my back. They call me a traitor. They call me a sinner. They say I'm greedy. And they say even worse things than that, too. I've lived in Jericho all of my life. I grew up here. I was the son of a tax collector. That's how I became a tax collector myself. I have my name on a dozen foundations and public works buildings. But people still dislike me. 
They despise me, some of them even. They don't know who I really am, despite all the evidence to the contrary. Even though I worship with them in the same synagogue week after week, even though I interact with them in the market, in the squares, even though my office space is next to theirs, even though my kids go to the same schools as their kids do, even though I've given away nearly half of my income to the people of the city, the people don't know me. They don't see me for who I really am. They refuse to see past my occupation and to see my heart, to see what's inside of me. Sure, they know who to speak to if they need a nice fat donation check for whatever they're trying to raise money for, but they won't come to my house for a meal or for a party. They're a little bit scared if my kids want to play with their kids. I've lived near them all of my life, but they don't know who I am. Nobody gets it that I really do care about other people, that I really do want to live a pleasing life, that I really do want to know about God and what he wants for me and for this world. The reason that I know so much about what Jesus taught about the rich and the kingdom of God is that I really want to know about this kingdom. I want to enter the kingdom. I want to be a part of it. I've eagerly devoured every teaching of Jesus that I can get my hands on any time people talk about him. I listen. More than anything, I just want to meet him. To just even to see him, to hear something that he has to say. I want to know Jesus. And that is what led me to that crowded square that day. The day that Jesus finally decided to come to Jericho, the, Jesus, the day that F Jesus finally passed my way. I was lost that day, but not in the way that most people think that I was lost. Most people think that I was lost because I was a sinner. I'm a traitor, a greedy SOB who wanted to take as much as he could for himself and who cares about anybody else. The truth is that that day I was lost in the crowd. Everyone knew my name, but nobody wanted to see my face. Nobody really knew my heart. You know, personally, I think they took kind of a perverse pleasure in blocking my way that day and getting in front of me. They know how short I am. And they stood in front of me so that I couldn't see Jesus when he was coming along. I'm sure they were sniggering to themselves, too, saying, how if I really, really wanted to see the teacher, maybe I should have brought my step stool along so that I could stand up high and see him that I might think I was pretty important when I went to collect their taxes, but I couldn't claim any public space on a public road as my own. And so I was lost in the crowd that day. I was blocked from viewing Jesus by people who didn't know who I was and didn't even care to get to know me. And really, why wouldn't they block me from seeing Jesus? Because if I couldn't see Jesus, then he couldn't see me. And everyone, even me, suspected that Jesus really wouldn't want to see a person like me, a wealthy person, a tax collector. I mean, Jesus, we knew he was an expert at picking people out from the crowd, but it was really the crippled people, the, the blind people, the disadvantaged in some way, the poor, those were the people Jesus saw. Not a wealthy man that everyone suspected was the worst kind of sinner. But I already mentioned that I was determined I mentioned that Jesus, he had something, some kind of appeal for me, and I can't even describe how or why that was the case. I'd, I'd never really met him before, but I'd heard about the things that he taught. I'd heard about the miracles that he worked, and those things had convinced me, and I just had to catch a glimpse. I just had to hear him if I could, if he was going to teach that day. And so I did something that probably would have shocked the crowd. It shocked me, actually, even a little bit. I saw a tree nearby, the place where I was standing, and I scrambled up it, just like a little kid, not like the grown man that I am, whatever you say about how short I am. And even though some of the people were snickering about the sight of a man in a tree, I didn't care, because immediately I could see Jesus in the distance. He and his followers were coming along. He was coming right for the tree where I was standing. And I knew that from my high vantage point, I'd be able to see him and I'd be able to hear everything that he had to say. And the leaves, they even gave me a little bit of cover. I could see him, I could hear him, but if he didn't want to see me, he didn't have to. He didn't have to look at me, the wealthy tax collector. 
who was well-known but disliked in his own hometown. But Jesus had other plans that day. Jesus didn't let me blend in with the tree leaves and hide. He wouldn't leave me lost in that crowd. Just like he said, Jesus that day had come to seek and to save the lost. And so just like that, as he passed by, Jesus found me. He found me hiding in that tree, peering out from the leaves. He found me in the crowd, that very crowd that had tried to block me from seeing him and him from seeing me in the first place. And he didn't just find me. He called out my name. Looking into the very tree where I was sitting, Jesus raised up his eyes and he looked right at me and he said, Zacchaeus! He called me Zacchaeus, not tax collector or traitor or you rich jerk or whatever names that people usually whispered about me behind my back. He called me Zacchaeus, which means pure or holy, even though nobody else believed that. Was it possible, I thought, was it just possible that Jesus believed that about me? And the surprises didn't stop there. After he called my name, he said, come down immediately because I must stay at your house today. All I'd hoped for that day was a glimpse of Jesus, maybe to hear him as he taught something. Never in a million years did I think he was going to ask to come to my house. This teacher, the healer, the miracle worker, the one who had all these terrible things to say about the rich and how they use their money, he wanted to come to my house. He wanted to eat with me. He wanted to stay with me. I can't tell you how overjoyed I was. I can't even tell you how I got down out of that tree. All I know is that before I realized it, I was standing right in front of him, and I was joyfully leading the way to my place. I knew I was going to throw Jesus a party he wouldn't soon forget. I was going to get the finest food and the best drink. I was going to invite everyone that I could find over to my place. I was going to give him the best room in my house with the finest linen, and he and his followers could stay in comfort with me. I was so overwhelmed that he actually wanted to eat with me. With me, the chief of tax collectors the one from whom no one else in the neighborhood would accept an invitation to a meal. Sure, they would take my charity, they would take my money, but they would never eat with me. To do so would have implied to others that they accept me as a friend, that they know what I'm doing and they're okay with it. In our society, if you're a respectable person, you are not friends with a tax collector. Not if you cared about your good reputation. I knew that. We all knew that. I'd stopped inviting people to my house years ago. But Jesus was different. Jesus saw through all that social garbage. He saw through the low opinion that everyone else held of me. And he saw to the person who I really was inside. The person behind that mask of a tax collector. I was good at my job, but my job is largely determined by my family. I didn't necessarily choose it. He saw my heart. He saw that I cared about the kingdom of God, that I cared about other people. He saw Zacchaeus, and he wanted to come and eat with me. But that's when the crowd kicked in again. They began to grumble, argue, complain. They thought that I had hijacked their meeting of this wonderful teacher. They thought it was unfair that Jesus chose to come and eat with me. And this is not the first time that Jesus ate, ate with tax collectors and sinners, however. Maybe the crowd just thought that they were more worthy than me of Jesus' time and attention. And maybe they were. But I couldn't get past the fact that Jesus had chosen me out of that entire crowd and come to stay at my house. And he called me by name, even though I was lost. Even though I was lost in the poor opinion and the hurtful stigmas of the crowd of my neighbors. But when they began to complain, I just, I just had to stand up for myself. I simply had to tell Jesus that they were wrong about me. 
Yes, I was a tax collector. Yes, I am the chief tax collector. But I'm also someone who cares about others. I'd helped these very neighbors who were grumbling against me in many, many ways. Obviously, they couldn't remember that very well. As a tax collector, yes, we engage in some deceitful practices. And yes, sometimes I got caught up in them as well. But as I pointed out to Jesus, if I ever remembered that I defrauded somebody, I'd give them back four times what I'd taken from them. I felt so bad about it afterward. And the rest of the money that I made through my tax collection business, well, no matter what you say about it, I was just playing by the rules of my profession. I'm not cheating anybody if all of us play by the same rules. Everyone's got to make a living somehow. I was just doing what I had to do to make my living. Usually I was able to shake off the low public opinion and the insults that people tossed my way. But they were saying this stuff today in front of Jesus, in front of this revered teacher. And I wanted more than anything for him to understand, for him to believe me, for him to know that I was not that person they all thought I was. The real miracle of that day, I still think all those years later, is that Jesus actually believed me. Jesus heard what I had to say, and he believed me. He looked at me after all the garbage that he heard about me from the crowd, and he declared, today salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a son of Abraham. He told that crowd who I really am. He told them, but he also reminded me who I was. He gave me an identity. He gave me dignity. He said, I'm a son of Abraham. And a son of Abraham is always worthy of love and respect and consideration. He saw past the garbage of public opinion, and he saw the person who I was inside. And this is almost the first time in my life that I had ever experienced this. You see, it doesn't really matter what other people think of you. That's what I learned that day, the day that Jesus came into town. It's really hard to hear a low opinion that other people hold of you and not believe it, even a little bit in your heart. It's hard to keep trying to impress other people by giving away your money to them, by helping out when you're allowed to help out, by making restitution if you do something wrong, and still have everyone believe that you're a cheat, a fraud, a traitor. When everyone else believes that, it's hard not to think of yourself in the same way. Maybe you know what I mean. Maybe part of my story has been part of your story as well that sometimes you feel lost in a crowd, lost by how other people perceive you, maybe from something you did in the past, maybe it's from your occupation, maybe it's something that happened that you can't go back and undo. Maybe you're haunted by a name that you've been called, a label you've been given, an insult that people have hurled at you. If this is true, I get it. I know what that is like, and that's who I was before I met Jesus, lost in a crowd of people that tried to tell me who I was, tried to tell me that I was unworthy to even look at Jesus, to even see him. And some days I began to believe them. One person said that before we do anything wrong and before we do anything right, God has named us and claimed us as God's own. But almost immediately, other things try to tell us who we are and to whom we belong. Capitalism, the weight loss industry complex, our parents, the kids at school, they all have a go at telling us who we are. But only God can tell us who we are. So God's first move is to give us our identity. And then the enemy's first move is to throw that identity into question. Identity is like the tip of a spool of thread, which, when pulled, can unwind the whole thing. And that is how it was with me. With every insult, 
with every turned down invitation to dinner, with every person who smiled to my face but then cut me behind my back, my identity had unwound like a spool of thread. No matter how much I believed that I was a different person than they all said, no matter what I did to prove them wrong, the fact is that they would not accept my attempts. They couldn't see past their preconceived notions. And because of that, I'd forgotten that I was a son of Abraham, that I was a son of God. But Jesus came along and spoke the words that restored that identity to me. Despite what the crowds told him about me, he said those words, that you are son of Abraham. This man who'd been lost from years of listening to the crowds rather than listening to God. I came to seek and save those who are lost. That's what Jesus said. And I was definitely one of the lost ones. I had lost my true identity as God's own beloved son. But when I met Jesus that day, he gave me that identity back. Jesus saw me in that tree and called me by my own name. And he told that entire crowd of grumblers that I, too, was a son of Abraham. Who do you let control your identity? Do you listen to the crowd? Do you listen to what others have said, or even maybe what still others still say about you? Do you listen to something that comes from your past, a mistake you've made? Do you let something that happened to you, a way that you've been hurt, control who you are today? Maybe you let a failure or a disappointment from your life tell you who you are. And let me tell you that day, nobody in the crowd, least of all me, expected that Jesus would say that I was a model of salvation, that I was almost the hero of the story, if we can use that word. Everyone would have suggested that Jesus might condemn me for being a tax collector, or that Jesus would condemn me for being wealthy. But instead of that, Jesus saw who I really was and called my name and reminded everyone who was there that I was God's beloved son. Every one of you is a beloved child of God as well. Every one of you was created for God's own pleasure, and every one of you is loved more deeply than you can imagine. If you don't believe me, then please believe this. You see set before you today the table of the Lord. This very same Jesus who walked through Jericho, who spied little Zacchaeus in the tree and called him by name, who said that he was a son of Abraham and a child of God, is the same man who kept walking on through Jericho, right on to Jerusalem, where he was put on a cross and where he died. And by doing this, by submitting to the cross and to death, Jesus is proving to you that he loves you so much that he would rather die than live without you. He tells you that you are, your, are his precious, that you are loved because you were bought, redeemed, and saved by his very own body and his very own blood. That's what we celebrate when we go to the table. If you've ever struggled with believing that God loves you, that you cannot be possibly good enough for Jesus to love you, that you are marked by an identity that somebody else gives you, remember that they are wrong. The only thing that matters is what Jesus says about you. And he has said with his own body and his own blood that he loves you, that he has claimed you for his very own precious child. And to prove it, he went to the cross. As we go to the table today, let us always remember that at this table we find forgiveness, we find salvation, and we find our identity as beloved children of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for the fact 
that you give each of us a name, an identity. We thank you that you came to seek and to save the lost, those who are lost in their sins, and those who are lost because no one knows who they really are, and those who are lost in many other ways as well. I pray that as we partake of your body and bread and blood at the table today that you've laid before us, that we would have full confidence in this, that you demonstrated your own love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. As we eat the bread and drink from the cup, may we never forget the love that brought this about. And maybe, may we never forget that because you went to the cross, each of us has an identity as a beloved child of God. Amen.